Welcome to our webcast, How to Modernize Billing When You Can't Change the Way Your Company Bills, brought to you by Argyle, the publisher of CFO Magazine and CFO.com, and sponsored by Billing Platform. I'm Joe Fleischer, and I'll be your moderator. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about our very distinguished guest. Joining us today is Matt Rigney, who is Senior Vice President of Billing Operations with Premier Global Services, Inc. And just by way of background, in addition to managing uh, Premier Global Services' billing function, Matt is res also responsible for uh, Premier Global Services' financial systems, and he uses his accounting background to tailor reporting for the financial planning and analysis group and other functional areas of the company. Now, before we get started with hearing from Matt's experience, I would like to give Matt the opportunity to uh, lay out our agenda. We'll then pose our first polling question. Then what we will do is launch into Matt's discussion of his experience. We'll then uh, incorporate uh, two remaining polling questions and also have a discussion with Matt uh, about best practices in uh, modernizing billing when you can't change the way your company bills. With that said, at this, ch at this stage, it is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Matt Rigney of Premier Global Services. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joe, and uh, thank, thank you for everyone joining today. So a little bit about the agenda that we have here today. I'm going to go over about PGI. So who is PGI? What makes our billing processes so complex? Industry change has made it more complex for us. So I just want to go over a little bit about PGI. Also going to go over why building a business case to modernize PGI's billing systems. So take a look at that, what our business case was there. Look at planning uh, billing system conversions. So just some thoughts that you should consider before migrating billing systems once you've made the decision to migrate. There's some items early on in the stages that you really should consider ahead of the migration. So taking a look at those and uh, we'll kind of go through those. Then we're going to go into some uh, top 10 lessons learned. So what we would do the same again, what would we do differently? As we look back, what we did right, what we did wrong. You can always easily identify the things that you did wrong. Um, sometimes it's hard to to realize those things that you did right. but uh, So we're going to kind of go over those top lessons learned there. And then benefits achieved. What benefits did we achieve? At the end of the day, we still have to send out an invoice to the customer. Uh, it has to be the same invoice as before. So what benefits are we actually achieving here? Because at the end of the day, we're, we still got to do the exact same process, maybe in a different manner, but we still basically have to send that invoice out at the end of the day. Based on that agenda, I'm going to turn it back to Joe. Thank you very much, Matt, and uh, looking forward to hearing your perspective. Before we hear again from Matt, we'd like to pose the first of three polling questions we'll intersperse throughout our webcast. Our very first polling question, speaking of complexity, which Matt alluded to, uh, we want to find out from you which, if any, of the following contribute the most to the complexity of your company's billing processes. And just to recap from top to bottom, multiple billing plans, multiple billing systems, multiple templates, uh, invoices in multiple languages, uh, multi uh, manual billing processes, something else other than those listed above. Uh, you can also indicate if your billing processes are not complex or if you don't know. And what we will do now is reveal how you have responded. And what we can see is that a uh, plurality uh, has indicated uh, multiple billing systems. That's a plurality. I would note that the next most prevalent response is multiple billing plans. So. Uh, uh, th those are the most prevalent options. And with that in mind, what I'd now like to do is turn the floor over to Matt, who will share his experience. After that, uh, we will intersperse some polling questions throughout his discussion, and then we will have a discussion with Matt about best practices. So at this, floor, uh, at this, at this point, rather, it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over once again to Matt Rigney. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. PGI, we're one of the world's largest dedicated provider of collaboration software with more than 75% of the Fortune 100 and nearly 45,000 enterprises who trust PGI and our Global Meet product suite to deliver high quality events and everyday communications. PGI has multiple products in our line. Big one is automated conferencing, which we'll, we'll talk about. Most people are used to that. Enter your passcode to join the conference. That used to be the way a lot of conferencing was done few years ago, which has changed in today's environment. We also have office-assisted conferencing, live events such as IR calls for and webinars, kind of like we're doing today. And then personal web conferencing, so you can do your screen sharing and have video, cameras, uh, those type things. We also have professional services, such as Modality, who goes in and helps you uh, with your Skype integrations and stuff like that. PGI, we're in 155 different countries. We have multiple rate plans. We have 18 different currencies that we bill in. 
So those are very, a lot of our complexity. PGIs have over 20 different acquisitions, and so every time you acquire another company, chances are you're also getting a new billing system. While we were able to integrate some early, whether you're just buying a customer base and, and just integrating that, or if you're buying a new product to get into a new market, those are types of things that make it more complex every day. If you see down there, you know, with PGI Glow Meet, we have iMeet Live, we have Pow Wow Now, iMeet Central, Modality. So some of these are different brands that we have that have their own complex rate plans or billing systems that as we bought them, those came over with them. So they weren't, we just didn't grow them from the ground up. So to try to integrate those in are, are pretty unique and they have all their, their own unique products customers and rate plans. In addition to that, uh, within some of these regions, we even have multiple billing cycles. So you may have customers who are billed on, you know, the 5th, the 12th, the 19th, or, and throughout the month. And then having in different regions too, so having the North America region for billing, the Europe region, and Asia. So, And then even within that, you can even, for some of these uh, platforms, you may even have a single person dedicated to some of those billing systems. So as you brought that over, did we have billing people within there that were to support that? And so those are still out in the organization. So there's a lot of different things, uh, especially through all these acquisitions that have, has caused a lot of complexity within PGI. That's what we're going to try to solve here. So going to the next slide here, making a business case for a new billing system. What did we need to do here? We need to really the ability to quickly react to changes. So a few years ago, or it was probably a little more than a few years ago, you know, our industry, like I was talking about, was automated conferencing. And automated conferencing was a big business. You entered your passcode to join the conference. And all that was basically this per-minute pricing. That we called up a customer. They said, well, you want to have toll-free, local access, whatever else. It was all this per-minute pricing. Well, as the industry changed, the industry started going to personal web conferencing. So having that app installed on your PC or on your phone, and you pulled up that app, and it dialed you or you could still dial in and then it had bundled minutes and shared minute plans. So you were buying this bundle of minutes with this web product and it was all included and you're not paying this permanent pricing. So for the customer, it was they knew how much they were paying every month. It was nice. So as part of that, we went to our vendor and at the time and started to look at what would it be for them to start to implement this bundled license pricing model. So they went out, they looked at it, they gave us, came back with a quote, and that quote was a significant investment for PGI. And so thinking about that and the amount of investment we had to do just to make this one change and not knowing what the industry is going to throw at us going in the future, thought, well, we've been on this platform 10 to 15 years. Let's look out and just see what else is out there. The Internet's changed a lot. There's a lot of these cloud solutions. There's all of this stuff that's out there today. So let's go take a look and just see are we better to sit here and develop custom stuff on this platform, or do we want to go out and look at other billing platforms that may be able to have some of these functionalities and meet our needs in the future, which we don't even know about today? So we wanted to be able to support the new stru pricing structures without significant investments. Making that one change and having to spend that much money just to add in a bundle and not knowing what we're going to need to next. The ability to reduce costs to implement changes. So any change that we need to make, whether it's a wording on an invoice and having some costs related to that. So what are those costs that you need to try to reduce? Standardize all our billing processes across the organization. So again, we had multiple billing organizations, one for each region plus all of those that we had that were as we acquired them and trying to get that back into kind of one standard billing organization that had a standard set of processes. So that would go to the next point of reducing the number of billing systems and consolidate on one platform. So we really wanted to find a platform that could, could integrate all of these different current billing systems because the back offices may stay separate, but integrate those feeds into one billing system and be able to bill out of one individual system. So that was something that we really needed to do. So having that flexibility, because there can be significant costs to migrate some of these billing systems, and some of them are very small billing systems. They're not a ton of revenue, but they still stand out there. They still have costs associated with them, whether it's a license cost or whatever, to stand up the billing system. And then we have personnel out there that may just be supporting that single billing system. So the ROI to basically move some of those billing systems into a consolidated system is significant compared to the amount of revenue that we may be getting off of that, that billing system. So, And then be able to sort, support the uh, business when the market changes. Oh, wait, skipped one there. 
to move to more of a self-service model versus a managed service model. So, and to discuss what that really means for us was that, you know, on a managed services model, what we would do is if we had any change, we would basically log a ticket with the vendor. They would kind of scope it out. Then you would go and they would give you an estimate for how much that change was going to be. And then you would say, okay, yes, yeah, so that's good. I'll go ahead and pay for that implementation or I'm not going to pay. It's not worth the investment for the company. And these were stuff like mass changes. Maybe you had a new report, a new extract you needed. Maybe you had a new customer come on board, a reseller that needed data in a specific format. And so those type of things, as well as invoice template changes, if you wanted to change the way the invoice was presented, stuff like that. So you'd log these tickets, they would go, and every time you made a change, there's a cost associated with it. Versus if we look at self-services, it's similar, but now you kind of have internal resources. So you have this software out there and it's built, but you still kind of log a ticket, but it, then it's internally. You may have a business analyst there that does the review and creates the stories, and we'll get more into stories and, and some of that later. And then a developer goes through and makes the changes. And then so you can do all the same stuff, but you're using internal resources versus having that managed services model. And the benefits there can be cost, but that may be offset by, you know, having to manage those resources internally. But the thing about the self-service model and, and kind of that is that you can basically build some of that stuff within the UI, the user interface for that billing system. So now to go create a new report, a new extract, maybe you just go and click reports new and, and be able to create that. It's not a ticket being logged. Invoice template changes. Now you can just go to a form and update the wording, update the whatever you need to without a, needing to log a ticket. So there are some things there that you may be able to do more of a self-service and actually give back to billing ops versus having this, this um, third party be able to make these changes for you, as well as developing new functionality there. So those are some things that moving to a self-service for span just services allows you to move some of those things back into your billing ops organization. And then support the changes, or support business changes when your market changes. Again, there, you don't know what the business is going to decide um, to do your product, your marketing group, but as they make changes, being able to support that and and move through that. So some of the items that we had was needed one system, but still be able to segment between regions or between systems. So still like in EMEA, they want to kind of close their own invoices, but they're all integrated in one system. So being able to segment that out. Those are a few of the uh, business cases we had. And so after looking at all of that, is then when we went to management and made the decision to move to a new billing platform, which would give us significant savings and allow for internal resources due development. So moving on to the next about planning billing system conversions here. So there is some advanced planning that you can do that helps you stay on track during your migration. So for the first one, plan for support of both systems during migration. Are you going to have the same personnel work on both systems? And it really depends on how you're going to, what methodology you're going to use to migrate to a new billing system. The first one, if you're going to have a flash cutover, so you're going to build this system and have that waterfall approach to where you're going to live with all your customers on one, at one time and just move them over in one big, big bang, right? That's one approach. Another approach may be a new product approach to where if you're rolling out a new product, maybe at that point, it's a good time to basically roll out a billing system that would support that new product. And as you get that up and running, then start to migrate some of your other customers over. That works okay in certain cases. It wasn't the way we chose to do it, but if you were, um, if you did have a totally new product and your customers were going to convert totally to that new, but if you still had to support the new product plus old product plans and rates and whatever else, that might not be the best way to go. So the third way that I look at it is then a phased approach, right? So looking at how are you going to do that for a phased approach, so that's kind of the approach we went to. And within that, you need to figure out how you're going to segment your customers and your products, right? How do you choose what, what is in phase one, phase two, however many phases you decide to have? So we really chose a phased approach just for the fact that we have multiple billing systems, billing cycles, customers on different pricing plans, old pricing plans, new pricing plans. So that's why I think the phased approach worked well for us. So that, that's just something to think about before you get started is how to support both systems during the migration. The uh, second part here is to fully scope out, is to full scope of the new billing system, including core, f core structure and functionality. So. You need to fully scope out the requirements since you really can't go live with only 
partial features when you go from one billing system to the next. You really need to understand what all this functionality is and how to plan to get to, to that goal line. At the end of the day, if you are billing a customer today $100, you can't migrate them to the new billing system and bill them 50 bucks and be like, ah, sorry, didn't have that feature built out. Just something that you really need to, to think about. And in two months, hey, we'll have that feature built out and you'll get your $100 bill again. So really all your features have to be built out. There is no, ah, it's partially there. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute because project styles, which I'll go to next. So, and you don't have to have fully understanding every single individual little bit of the requirements, such as possibly taxes or stuff like that that may have been put in a long time ago, but you really need to understand at least the high level. And then when you get to that part of your implementation, you can start to dig down into more of the requirements, but really understanding everything. You know, how do you send out an invoice in the new system? How do you do your taxes? How do you, how does a customer access the portal to look at their bills? Those type things. So, Really getting all of your requirements there is a, a big thing to do up front. So next part I'm going to go through is align project styles between billing operations, IT, and your billing vendor. So with part of going to this, as I mentioned, self-service, we have different project styles. Your billing vendor is going to have one project style. They're probably going to have somebody that they give to you that dedicated to your project as you go through this migration. But your IT department, and I don't know how many of you have dealt with your IT department in this agile methodology that everybody's gone to now. So agile methodology basically is this two-week sprint that they get the requirements, they spend two weeks developing that functionality and release it after two weeks. While that works well, I think from a, a product standpoint, if I'm delivering new product, new functionality out to my end users from a, a product standpoint, from a billing standpoint, I don't think it works as well, and you know that's just an opinion on my side, but you know because again, we have to have all of those features and functionalities ready for the customer when we move the billing over. So how do you take a project style of someone in billing operations or finance that has uh, kind of I know what the end is, I know I've still got to bill that customer a hundred bucks with this agile methodology that are these two week sprints, and here's your new feature this week, here's your new feature next two weeks to get to where you can have that full invoice out to there. And then include your billing vendor as well. And I'll go over some of that a little bit further, a little bit more later. Also, determine the structure of your new customer hierarchy, I think, is another thing for as you're planning. And this doesn't only go with your customer hierarchy. It could go with any hierarchy or any way that you're going to set up the new system. Determine how that's going to be set up. Do you want to change the way it's set up from your old system to your new system? There may be new functionality stuff that may change the way the system works in, in this new system. And do you want to go ahead and embrace that new functionality, which may make it the migration look, take a little longer, be a little harder uh, to try to get some of that in? It also may make it easier. So that's something that you really need to scope out up front. Also, plan on doing cleanup activities in advance. So there's some stuff in there that you can basically go through that has as much cleanup that you can do in advance, such as possibly consolidating your customer hierarchy, removing some old reports, determining certain price plans that don't need to be migrated to the new system. With this new system, if you're going to develop it, don't plan to bring stuff over that isn't being used anymore and clutter it up. To me, I think of it just like when you sell a house, move to a new house. As you clean out your old house, you're going to give stuff to Goodwill or, or throw stuff away. Same thing you need to do here. Let's not clutter up your new house with all this old junk that we've carried over from our previous previous billing system. So at this point, and then what we're going to go over next is some of the lessons learned. So what we would do the same and what we would do differently. And really, I broke those out into four different things. The organization, what, what we do is different in the organization. The rollout approach, kind of what we've done on the rollout. Some of the billing processes and then look at the benefits that we received. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And what we're going to do before we cover some lessons learned, we're going to pose the second of our three polling questions, and then we will get into those lessons uh, learned in just a moment. Uh, our second polling question asks attendees to indicate the extent to which you agree with the following statements. My finance team, 
has a clear understanding of how my company can streamline its billing processes. We've already talked about what aspects of billing processes may require streamlining, such as in the case of uh, acquisitions or organizations or companies that have multiple product lines or uh, divisions and uh, multiple billing templates. So we want to find out uh, the extent to which you agree with the statement, my finance team has a clear understanding of how my company can streamline its billing processes. What you're welcome to do is select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the submit button so we can record your response. From top to bottom, the choices are strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or I don't know. What we'll do is give you just a few more seconds so we do have a representative uh, percentage of uh, attendees who are responding to this polling question. I want to give you attendees sufficient time to respond. Then what we will do is summarize how you have responded, and then we will hear about those very lessons learned that, uh, that Matt uh, has, has mentioned. Uh, just one more second, and then we will reveal how you have responded once again to the question that asks you to indicate the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement that your finance team has a clear understanding of how your company can streamline its billing processes. And what we can see, what is readily apparent is that um, a minority, so not a majority, uh, interestingly enough, a minority of respondents, or uh, uh, I put it this way, we're, we're not quite there. It's uh, uh, it's close to a majority, but uh, overall, a just under a majority agree, and even among that close to a majority, small percentage strongly agree. So the point is that um, even among attendees of our webcast, there's not necessarily agreement. I would acknowledge, though, that among respondents, about a third of respondents at the very least disagree or even strongly disagree, and then about 18% of respondents don't know. But I would like to highlight that a majority do not necessarily agree, and indeed among those who agree, there's not necessarily strong agreement. So in this context, I'd now like to talk about uh, or give Matt the opportunity to talk about lessons learned, and now we'll turn the floor over to Matt. Uh, thank you, Joe. All right, so to go over, you know, Organization lessons learned. The team and support structure must be well-defined. So in looking back at some of the things that we went through, some of the struggles as you go through a billing organization, the first one I'm going to go through is role, define roles in advance. Understanding who's going to take on the new responsibilities and provide support. So as part of this, we went through kind of and had, had we need to define the roles of each team and how they're going to support. Because again, we've got now billing ops, IT, and the billing vendor all integrated into this one migration. So the thing we really needed there was a dedicated team to help work through this billing migration. Because one of the things that we learned out early was if you don't have a dedicated team, stuff's going to come up and, and always trump that. But from the uh, dedicated groups for migration, you're going to have your billing ops, so who's going to set up the stuff in the system, the packages, the products, do system setup. you got your IT group who's going to develop new the functionality, all the data feeds that go in there, and then you got your billing vendor who helps you with the new features, helps you with the setup. And so really getting the roles defined in advance on who's going to take these responsibilities, who's responsible for certain setup and configuration within the system, um, as you go to roll out this new system is really what you need to make sure that un everybody understands kind of their role. Staffing is another place, so and it's necessary to add project team members early. So adding resources to specific teams before taking on as some of those responsibilities maybe from your old vendor were, were if you're going from that managed services to the self-services were actually taken on and done by that vendor, and, and that's what you were paying for. But if you go to more of the self-service model, some of those actually fall back into the team. And so now you've got more work coming back into the team. And for one of ours was kind of what we call our billing systems group, so the IT side of, of billing, to where as they send over the co companies, the clients, uh, all the usage related to that customer, stuff can fail there. And when stuff fails, kind of in the old world, it would fail in the system and could be corrected by the, the billing vendor, where now that actually comes back to them and they have to do that research. Is why did a client fail? Why did a, the company getting sent over fail? If anything doesn't go right, they have to research that one by one to get figure out how to get that. And over time, that gets better, but initially, since it is a new system, since it is there are new integrations, those things are just going to happen more often than something that's been around 10 or 15 years. So looking to invest in those type places. Then you also have maybe some temporary IT members as you go to develop this functionality. 
I don't know if it's your current IT team, the other IT team, but adding potentially somebody there that can help do the development because you're going to have all this initial development up front to try to get the product to at least a minimum viable product in terms of doing your billing and then adding features on later. So it depends on, on where that's at and uh, so having resources there as well. And then in billing ops, you, you've got kind of your core billing ops, which we just talked about to find the roles in advance and, and having those team members which are really going to support from a billing ops function, anything from training, um, how to get stuff in, those type things. So then again, to go to the next point here, IT support. So again, with IT support, and actually I'll talk about just regular, anybody that's supporting the billing system, you're going to have both production and development or development production simultaneously. So you're going to be supporting both of, of those systems. So you're sitting there trying to develop this new system and you have your production. So with a phase migration, and I guess if you're a waterfall, you're not going to have that kind of development support, but with a phase migration, as you move customers over, you're going to have both the that kind of these customers are now into production. We still have this development going on and we may have production issues. So how to manage that going forward. And then a billing learning curve. So again, adapting for us, it was adapting to an agile methodology for development while trying to maintain a project plan. This agile methodology, which then has a release where they migrate stuff every two weeks and release it, we had to go back and kind of put some more parameters around that because we couldn't have basically them releasing stuff into production once once we had live customers in there every two weeks. Otherwise, you need to go back and do some type of remediation testing, whatever else. So building a project plan around there that allowed for these releases to almost get more bundled up, put into there, have kind of a full regression testing, making sure that whatever they were putting in there wasn't going to affect other components. So if they put in something for a package to fix the package, do whatever else, it may have consequences outside of that a small change that they thought was going to make and uh, impact other customers. So it was a learning curve for our billing group to kind of get used to this agile methodology and work with them. And then we had to compromise a little bit there to figure out what would work good for IT and what would work good for the billing operations. So that was a, a little a learning curve for billing. Going in on to the rollout, kind of the lessons learned here and how to manage multiple priorities. Again, I think I just went through this just a minute ago, but can't reiterate this one too much, is that production always wins. So issues with production will always take priority over any development or migration issues. Initially, when we started this, we actually, one of our billing ops migrations person actually supported some of the resellers that we had as well. And while it was fine because it was only a, a few hours of time during the month, what would happen is if some production issue came up, then it may take a couple days, a week, or whatever it would be to to support that issue, well, all that does is push off everybody else and, and make that whole project go longer. So that was one of the things that we, we made a change was to try to, to isolate and have the migration team set up to, to do this migration that was totally focused on migration. Otherwise, there were priorities that would come out then from other places that would take longer and push the project out further. So again, on the same thing here, parallel system. So here you've got products and packages that have to be set up and tested in both the old and new system, again, during a phase rollout. So maintaining these parallel systems, if a new package or marketing or product comes out with a new product or package, you may have customers buying it on the old system and the new system. So you have to go through and set up the packages in both. So it's going to be extra work on, both, on the team to set up those both packages. Plus you have to test them. Plus, you also have to think about something like sales or care, who if they're talking to a customer, how do they know which billing system, which billing system to go to in order to pull the invoices to look at, the, look at something about billing for these customers? So there's items like that that you kind of having parallel systems cause a little issue. One thing that we all know about today is, is Wayfair decision. It, again, it, having to implement state taxes on both systems. So, Again, that's another one that's very relevant to today, to where Wayfair, with that decision, so these states have their the nexus um, taxes and have all that passed. So having to implement taxes for these for these different states is a really good example of, of trying to put those in multiple systems. So it's going to create, ultimately, double work for many functions and create inefficiencies. So trying to figure out how to manage that will be one of the the things that you'll have to do. One of the things we did, at least from a package and product standpoint, was have one team that, or one person, one or a couple people, actually do it in both systems. So that way, they were sure it was set up and tested in one system and the other system, both at the same time. So 
you try to find ways around that to, to, to simplify it and do that. So training, let's go to the third point here, training. Don't train too early, but include staff during build and have members from all teams on site during rollout. So uh, we did some training early on. And while it was good, if they, again, they don't touch the system. We all know that. You don't know how to use it anymore. And so you have to be careful with training too early. But the other thing you don't want to do is that you don't want to not include your staff and think that some other group, now that we have this dedicated group over there, is out there building a system and are, and all of a sudden you're just going to have them use it, right? Uh, so you want to have them included. So, But, again, they still have to pr support their day-to-day -day needs, the production as they go through. So, you, you know, you have this rest of your team over here. So how to keep them involved. So that's something to think about. You don't want them to feel like somebody else is over there developing the system and all of a sudden they're going to have to use it. They have a lot of great input on the way it works, some of the inefficiencies that we have today, and how to, if we're going to go ahead and put a new system in, what to think about to, in order to make that more efficient going to the future. So those are some of the rollout lessons learned that we have here. So moving on to the uh, process lessons learned. So your billing organization will change, so I will say that. So again, even though you're, you can't change the way your company bills, you can alter some of the billing processes. This goes back to building new analytics into your billing process to help validate billing accuracy. So take advantage some of some of the new features early in this new system, because chances are they're going to have some new features, new functionality, such as billing systems and billing platforms today have you know, much more analytics built into them. So building some of that customer trending, product trending, those type things, so you can see that early on if anything is going on with your company. It feels like sometimes in the past where you would send something to accounting, they would book it, and all of a sudden they're like, hey, what's going on here or here? And so then you have to go back and do that research. So being able to kind of do those analytics up front before you send it to the accounting or the finance organization is always helpful. Um, and it'll point out a lot of issues before you do the billing runs and before you send out invoices. So if you have any issues there, being able to solve those. So again, that'll only help out your, your team, uh, but also your customers. They, they like accurate invoices as well. So some of your team responsibilities here. The team responsibilities are going to shift and change as the new platform goes live. So the same resources will be managing, again, both in both systems during rollout. So as part of that, some things you may want to think about is actually getting some, some uh, temporary support in there to help out during those times to where you can have some of your more senior people work on maybe the new building system and work on supporting getting these new processes in place and then maybe bringing in some, some temporary or some support to try to help backfill some of those areas that are left there. Otherwise, you, you don't want to overwhelm your team with having too much work to do there during this migration. So to the next point there, your teams will be resistant to change. So with the way we set up, the teams will be resistant to change, and having separate project team causes issue among teams. So like I said, we needed to have a focused project team to be able to look at this and really drive it forward and make sure that we were going to keep moving and not have to deal with these production issues. But then you have had these people that have worked on this system for 10, 15 years, 20 years, and they're, they don't see anything wrong with the current system. While it works for what it needs to, will it be able to support your business needs in the future? I mean, that's something that as a manager or as management needs to look at. And, and understand those things. So they're going to be resistant to change. There's nothing wrong with the billing system that you have today. Why are we going to a new billing system? And so that is something that you have to get the team to really buy in on. One way to do that is to maybe get initial customers onto the system, right? So once you kind of have all the features and functionality ready, is maybe figuring out what segment of customers you can start moving on there. Maybe it's new logos, right? So we did that. We actually had all our new logos start to go on to the billing platform, and that required some of the, the people supporting it day to day to actually go in and have to, you know, start using the system, but at a volume that's not like supporting all of your customers once you do a big, massive migration, right? So it was a way to kind of get them into the system once they start realizing that, hey, it still calculates correctly, all the volumes coming in correctly, the packages calculate, and all these things, then they start to see some of those benefits. Those are just some things in how to get that the team to really start to see that the system does work, and it works essentially the same way because every billing system basically has to do the same thing. So just to really start to get them in and realize that. So you may want to develop, to the last point on the slide, you may want to develop your building system for the future, but it needs to address current needs. So 
one of the hard things here is when you we had to actually build some new back office processes to support communicating with multiple billing systems simultaneously. Again, we had over 12 billing systems, but all we're doing as we go through this migration, guess what? We're adding another billing system. So again, we had to actually modify some new processes to be able to send data over to the new billing system and know where where to send the data. But you are adding another billing system. You're adding more complexity during this migration. So you need to, you're going to have to make some changes to in your back office potentially to be able to support this. So those were some items that we had to change there. So to go over to the benefits achieved. On the benefits achieved, there are three big benefits for billing operations. We'll go first, we'll go with flexibility. So we have the ability now to basically reprocess single invoices. And we kind of went from this managed services and the way the system was set up for, it was this batch processing. So every night they went through it, ran all the rules, ran through all of the, the steps. And then at the, the next morning you come in, it's complete, and then you can go look at the billing data. Well, nowadays where it's more of a, a live near real-time processing, so which gave us the ability to, to look at certain invoices. It also gives the ability as we go put in new rates into the system if the contract changes or what, be able to put those in and then in a few minutes actually see those rates on an e-file or to be able to pull out a file, see those rates, make sure that we got them in correctly, kind of do our audit of any rates that went in the system early. And then those, so that was really nice. And then as you go to close, once you close all your invoices and that you do those analytics, which because some charges won't go on to that invoice until later, would be to open up, if you notice an issue, being able to open up a single invoice for us and then reclose it in a matter of a few minutes versus having to wait overnight. And then if there's anything wrong, you would just have to delay all customers' invoices. So and that's the way it would work in the, in the past. So the development of reports within billing operations. So one of the things we did do was we brought back kind of reporting back into billing operations where before we'd have to, again, submit a ticket, get that report changed, get some changes. Now, I will say that we did kind of break out reports a little bit. So we do have kind of system reports, invoice registers, the accounting reports, some type of reseller reports that, you know, need to kind of go through that process of being scoped out, making sure what it's going to impact before any systems are changed. So we kind of have those reports, but then we have all the other reports, maybe sales needs a report, maybe billing wants a report to kind of do some more analytics on or look at some exceptions, so those type things. So. We're able to do those as well. The second item here is consistency. Again, one-time product setup in one system for all regions. So that's really nice that we can set up a product one time by one person or one group, do all the testing, and then it's ready for all the regions to be able to use. So that's a big efficiency. Uh, instead of marketing coming out, here's your product, send it to all three regions. It has to get up, set up separately, tested separately. So that was a big efficiency efficiency there. We also found some efficiencies in the way we do recons, checklists, uh, to be consistent among the regions. So one of the things that as you look at your processes, you'll notice that having three different regions, three different organizations, that a lot of the recons that you do, even though they're very similar in nature and they were accomplishing the same thing, they were actually done differently. So figuring out which of those recons and what was the best method and maybe even consolidating that back to one global reconciliation or checklist was good. So we were able to, to do some things there to change those processes and see which one was more efficient and, and change the different regions to be able to have a standard process for consistency. So uh, consolidation, so reduction in the number of systems globally, consolid consolidation of duplicate reports and removal of legacy pricing plans. Those are all things as you consolidate that is nice cleaning up your house, whatever. But the other thing that is a, a consolidation piece is to be able to give customers a single global bill, even if it's using different products or different and reducing the manual entries. Again, growing by acquisitions or having a lot, having different acquisitions, you know, if a customer wanted a, a single bill for all of their things, we sometimes had to go through and put in manual processes to try to get that single bill uh, since they were on different back offices. So as we consolidate these, systems onto one system, that just is part of the natural integration into one system, and having a, that consolidated bill is nice. Um, so at this point, I want to thank you, and uh, I am going to turn it back to Joe. Thank you very much, Matt, for sharing your experience, and what we're going to do now is
pose our third of our three polling questions. We'll then devote uh, some time to uh, posing some questions to Matt, to following, up, following up on your presentation, Matt, and also set aside some time uh, during that uh, portion of our webcast to address some great questions from attendees. Uh, first, let's pose the third of our three uh, polling questions for attendees. And what we want to find out is within what time frame, if any, does your company plan to streamline its billing processes. And just to recap, from top to bottom, the choices are this year, next year, the year after next, we have no plans, or I don't know. What we'll do is give you just a few more seconds to respond. We'll then summarize how you have responded. And then we'll uh, turn the floor once again over to Matt. We'll pose some questions to Matt and also address some great questions that we have received from you, from you, uh, our attendees. Uh, but again, just a second or two more to give attendees enough time to respond to our polling question, once again, our third of three, within what time frame, if any, your company plans to streamline its billing processes. And what we can see right now is that among respondents, I would say that a significant percentage don't know, so about a third, a little more than a third don't know. I'd also acknowledge, though, that about uh, a little more than 28% uh, of respondents uh, plan to streamline billing processes, if not this year, then next year, or even the year after next. So a pretty even split, I would say, a pretty, uh, pretty close uh, split, if you will, between those who don't necessarily know or those who plan to do so either this year, next year, or the year after next. What we'd now like to do, as I said, is address some questions not only from attendees, but also before then, we have some questions that I uh, wanted to pose uh, to you, Matt. And I think one thing that I want to ask the first of several questions I want to ask in the time that we have remaining, and keeping in mind that uh, what attendees uh, can learn, what senior finance leaders can learn, I think the first question we want to ask uh, is in terms of the validation and testing and making sure everything uh, is, uh, is the way it should be before you go live, what would you, uh, what would you recommend that finance leaders keep in mind in particular when preparing to validate and test uh, processes, you know, given the topic of our webcast, you don't want to have to reconfigure your business to reflect your billing system. So how can one validate and test processes, billing processes, to make sure everything ultimately is the way it should be? I wanted to hear your uh, your thoughts, Matt. Yeah, so that's always a, a complicated one. But really, at the end of the day, like I talked about before, if I'm billing you 100 bucks today, yeah, I'm going to bill you $100 next day. You know, there's really, it's really hard to see the you know the huge benefit there but so in in creating a parallel what we had to do for all of our testing was really set up a parallel environment where we took historical data so you know we took august data whatever that is took a couple months of data loaded in all of your customers all your clients all the usage rates subscriptions everything else that has to go into this go back and close all the invoices and really compare to the, your production invoices and really setting up a good process around how to do that because it's not always easy to go back and kind of almost recreate an invoice in another system. But then really creating a good audit model that really breaks out the any issues that you may have into buckets, kind of saying, okay, well, these these had rate issues, right? These were had usage that may have fallen into a different period. They were supposed to go on this invoice and they went on this invoice. So causing issues kind of in your, this parallel environment. Again, we talked about how certain charges, certain need to be set up in both systems. So making sure that those are the same across both systems. So then as you go through that, you close all your invoices and you really do uh, an invoice to invoice match and make sure that, you know, there are no issues. And going back and doing that for a couple months, to make sure you don't miss anything if a customer didn't use features certain month, those type things, and really getting that warm fuzzy that everything matches and it's set up correctly and you're not going to run into any issues. So, And then there may be a certain set of your customers there that these migrations and as you go through them, they were on such special rate plans, they were on such had such custom pricing that to migrate them, you almost have to go back and do these manually and set them back up annually in the new system. Because that's one of the hardest things that you have to do if you're going to migrate systems is try to migrate rates and all the stuff associated with the customer that's all been put in one system to pull that out, load it into another system, and try to get that same answer. So it's, it's not easy, and, and validations are a huge part of your whole testing and to make sure that everything in this new system is set up correctly and you are ready to bill using it. So. Oh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I think we have time uh, 
uh, for maybe one or two more questions. And one really important question, and you covered this toward the end of your presentation, I think it is worth uh, covering once again, uh, proving, demonstrating that change is good to members of your organization, especially if they are comfortable with the, let's say, current way of billing. Um, what are some best practices, particularly for finance leaders, to get buy-in and support for change with regard to uh, with regard to making sure that uh, billing processes uh, that an organization can identify opportunities to streamline or increase the efficiency of, of its billing processes. How do you get that buy-in, especially if you're a, a leader in the finance team? Well, one of the first ways you got to do is really get them to use the system. Um, so get them in, get them using it, and as they now that we're we have some of that self-service, the you know being able to make these changes having them have the feedback of, hey, this would be nice if we could do X, Y, Z, if we could look at rates this way, if we could do, and then being able to put that on kind of a development plan, uh, maybe it's an agile, it goes through the development process, and in a couple of weeks being able to see that new feature rolled out into the system uh, and, and saying, hey, wait, we can change the way it's done if we see something's not exactly, if we need, if it's going to be more efficient for us. So now they kind of have a voice on how the system is going to act, how the system is going to do things going forward. And so I think once they kind of see that and they, they realize that these things can be changed and new processes can be developed, it really gets them thinking of, like, why am I doing this process this way? What else can we do there to streamline our processes or make them more efficient for not only billing but for sales, for any other organization care? and building that around there. So, And that, that's a really key point as well, is that um, rather than having to adapt your business to reflect the capabilities of your billing system, uh, making sure that essentially that your billing system reflects the needs of your business and also adapting your billing processes. And I, and I think one thing that you perhaps hinted at, uh, Matt, was recently even PGI was offering services, let's say, based on time, you know, say per minute. Are you finding more and more that there are different business models, such as subscription services that require flexibility in the billing processes? In other words, uh, what changes have you seen to your business you know, with, with PGI, business models, such that one has to adapt billing processes to reflect them? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. Just trying to keep up, you know, marketing is always coming up with new ideas. Product has new features, bundling stuff for the customer. The customer wants more of a, um, a bill that is dependable. They're, it's the same every month. I can budget for it. Uh, so just building all of that into your system and building those capabilities is nice. Yeah, and 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 essential, absolutely. So uh, and and that's uh, really key as uh, companies adapt their business models. So just want to thank you, Matt, for the opportunity to uh, learn from your experience. And uh, also want to note what will follow from our webcast. Uh, this webcast will be available on demand later this week within the webcast section of CFO.com. At that point, you'll be able to view and listen to a streaming archive of our webcast, download a PDF document that comprises slides from our webcast, click on a link to view information about upcoming events that offer the opportunity to hear from and meet finance leaders in person. And if you've responded to all three polling questions during our live webcast, retrieve your CPE certificate. At the very end of our webcast, we will invite you to complete an online feedback survey. The feedback survey will appear in a separate browser window that you will be able to view if you've turned off your pop-up blocker within your web browser. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. Once again, Matt, we very much appreciate such an engaging, informative uh, presentation and discussion. And also, we want to thank attendees for joining us as well. And we'd like to take this moment to thank attendees for joining us for our webcast, How to Modernize Billing when you can't change the way your company bills. Brought to you by Argyle, the publisher of CFO Magazine and CFO.com, and sponsored by Billing Platform. We thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.